English revision of the poem Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney. General advice. Don't focus on what you can't do. You're not expected to teach yourself new material. Use this time to revise and prepare revision materials. These will be incredibly useful in Year 11. You only have one hour of English per day. So set yourself one or two tasks that you want to achieve and do them. Try a variety of different activities. You might decide to just do online tasks through Seneca or Sam Learning one day and then try some written work the next day, followed by a day of making revision materials. A reminder of the set tasks. If you go to File Explorer, Pedmore Shared Area, Q Drive, English, Student Might, Year 10 Home Learning. Or you can go into www.samlearning.com or the app at senecalearning.com. Sign up as a student, type in your class code that was given to you by your teacher. <clears throat> Revisit prior learning. So reread the 15 poems in the Power and Conflict Cluster in your AQA anthology. Select three key quotations from each poem. Create revision cards for these and learn them. Make notes on how each of the 15 poems can be linked together and why. It is really important that you understand each of the poems. BBC Bite Size is a really good start if you don't have your anthology with you. All the poems are listed. Choose one poem to focus on at a time and make sure you're able to do the following. Briefly explain what the poem is about. Link the poem to different ideas, themes. Choose, annotate and learn three key quotations, creating them into revision cards. To challenge yourself, explore wider reading and contextual information. There are new resources in the whole home learning folder to help you. Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney. We are prepared. We build our houses squat. Sink walls in rock and roof, then we could slate. This wizened earth has never troubled us. With hay, so as you see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost. Nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean, leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale, so that you listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. But there are no trees, no natural shelter. You might think that the sea is company, exploding comfortably down on the cliffs. But no, when it begins, the flung spray hits the very windows, spits like a tame cat, turns savage. We just sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded with the empty air. Strange. It is a huge nothing that we fear. So what is the poem about? The narrator describes how a community thinks it's well prepared for a coming storm. As the poem goes on, their confidence starts to disappear as the storm develops. The poem and the sounds of the storm are described and the ending of the poem describes a fear as the storm hits the island. We can see this poem as a dramatic monologue. It's the perspective of a, vill of a villager on a remote island, probably the Irish Atlantic. It's about the storm, the storms and his community face um, and the effects from the storms. If we focus on the title itself, Storm on the Island, You'll notice there is no article of the A or the the to begin the title. The description is simple and made even simpler, generalising it so that the storm could describe any storm on the island. So let's have a look a little bit about Seamus Heaney. He was a Northern Irish poet who won the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature in 1995. Sadly, though, he died in 2003. He often wrote about themes um, such as childhood, nature and his homeland. And this poem itself, Storm on the Island, was published in 1966. So he was born in Northern Ireland in 1939 and he's the eldest of nine children. His father was a farmer in rural County Derry. And much of Hina's poetry is about the countryside and farm life of his childhood. At the age of 12, Heaney won a scholarship to the boarding school of St Columns College in the city of Derry, 40 miles from his rural home. So 
His education included studies at Queen's University in Belfast, where he also served as a lecturer at the end of the 1960s. He made his debut as a poet then, but continues to divide his time between his own writing and academia. He worked at Carisfort College in Dublin, at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts and at Oxford University. So his, poem, his poetry is often down to earth. For him, poetry was like the earth, as something that must be ploughed and turned. Often he paints the grey and damp Irish landscape. Peat Moss has a special place in his poetry. The poems are often connected with daily experiences, but they also derive motives from history, all the way back to prehistoric times. Seamus Heaney's profound interest in the Celtic and pre-Christian, as well as in Catholic literary tradition, has found expression in a number of his essays. Now let's focus on the form of the poem. So it's written in blank verse, which mirrors the patterns of everyday speech and makes the poem sound like part of a conversation. The first person plural we is used showing how this is a collective communal experience. The poem is all in one stanza. It's compact and sturdy like the houses. So we've got unrhymed dynamic pent pentameter with blank verse. The lines are unjammed. Sentences do not stop with lines. The last sentence, the last full sentence, strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear, is a strong indication of reaching the end of the speaker's pondering. Let's have a look at how the poem is structured. The poem itself shifts from security to fear. The, sen the sentence, but no, seems to be a turning point, a volta with the slow pace of the monosyllabic phrase and the caesura reflecting the last moments of calm before the storm. There are contrasting descriptions of safety and fear within the poem. The narrator uses a lot of words to do with safety and security at the beginning of the poem, and then the tone changes throughout. And the sense of danger increases as familiar things become frightening during the storm. There is direct address. The narrator involves the reader in his sphere by speaking directly to you. Violent imagery. The storm is described in violent, often warlike terms with similes, metaphors and personification, combining to emphasise the danger and effects of the storm. And then we've got the use of sounds. There are forceful sounds, example blast, which is used to demonstrate the strength of nature. And the poem also uses assonance and sibilance sounds to reflect the noise of the wind and waves. It creates a noisy recreation for the use of consonants and assonance and alliteration of the wind and rain thrashing the bare island. You've got the word comfortable, which creates explosions of waves which echo on the cliffs with a hard C sound, providing the sound of the attacking wave and finally the sound on the cliffs echoing the hiss as the waves retreat over the stones. Later when the water is flying the spray hits the windows and an internal rhyme with spits repeats the harsh harsh sounds. The poem ends with open empty sounds including a half rhyme between air and fear. If we have a look at the use of voice it begins with the resolute determination of someone sure about himself and his people. The simplicity of the sentence, we are, we are prepared, speaks of confidence. There is a self-deprecating humour in the phrase, this wizened earth. Self-deprecating is the idea of belittling someone or something. It's the impression the speaker is glad not to have to bother at being able to grow anything. But there's also a friendly tone. Imagery. The speaker compares the sea to a cat, a cat that is fickle and friendly, but the cat that then can scratch you. So it's the idea that the sea um, is known to them, but it can turn just like a cat could. The wind is compared to an attacking aircraft. Comparisons here have different effects. It makes the community seem like they're defending themselves against an invader. On the other hand, um, it's familiar and comfortable to them. There's an undercurrent of knowing the sea like a pet. 
even an unpredictable one. It seems that life on an island produces people who can think of something in two ways at once without worrying contradictions. Let's think about the feelings and attitudes that exist within the poem. There is a move between defiance at the start or humour and finally the admissions of fear at the end. Throughout, the narrator maintains a calm tone. He's sure of the thickness of the stone walls around him. Heaney wants us to understand the self-confidence of the island people when they're faced with challenges. We could also fine tune these um, feelings and attitudes down to three, so safety. The first part of the poem shows that the community feels safe and they're prepared. There is a sense of fear. This sense of security changes to fear as familiar things change and become frightening, like the sea. Helplessness. The people can't do anything about their fear except wait for the storm to finish. Nature here is presented as powerful and a relentless force. There may be some words that you are unfamiliar with. So if you look at wizened, which is used in the third line, wizened means dried up. If you then look at the word stucks, which is used in line five, that's bundles of a crop that's stacked together and it's left in a field to dry. Strafe is also used and that's on line 17. That's to rake with gunfire at close range, often from the air. And then you've got the use of the word salvo, which is also in line 17, which is lots of gunfire, guns firing at once. So let's have a look at how the poem is broken down. Lines one to five, Heaney describes how the community prepares for the storm. Then lines six to 13, there is a change in tone from safety to danger. The violence and noise of the storm is described. Lines 14 to 19, you've got the fear of the islanders is conveyed through images of war. Now let's have a look in a little bit more detail at the poem itself. So we start with the line, we are prepared. We are prepared is a very strong opening statement that creates a feeling of safety. If you compare it to the last line, huge nothing that we fear, we can see there's a contrast in feelings. It's a simple comforting statement of strength and it sets the tone as secure and safe. We, that shows togetherness and community for the people on the island. If we then focus on the word squat, and sink walls in rock and good slate. So the second and third line, houses squat, sink walls in rock, good slate. There are lots of words about safety and security in the first two lines, and the end stopping reinforces this feeling of security, which disappears with the enjambment in the rest of the poem. If we look at the word squat in a little bit more detail, it suggests something is low down. You squat, if you squat, you're low down to the ground which gives an immediate suggestion of strength of the wind. If we then zoom in on the words roof and good, these words um, use assonance, which emphasises the connection perhaps between the people and nature. Let's move on to line three, this wizened earth. So it suggests from wizened earth that on the island um, it's barren, that nothing grows there, no crops. But they also could suggest that the earth to the to the narrator and to the people on the island is like an old friend. It saves them the bother of harvesting and the pain of lost crops because it goes on to say it never troubled us. So they don't have to worry about the storm and wind destroying the crops because nothing's ever grown there. So nature's doing them a favour by allowing nothing to grow there. So they don't have to worry about the loss of that and the pain of, of the loss of the crops. If we then have a look at the use of the words stacks and stucks, you've got alliteration here, which stresses the solidarity and the strength of togetherness of the islanders. If we go on to line six, the use of the word company. So the word company is used here and on line 12 to emphasise the loneliness of the setting. It's quite a lonely place. So a sajura is used after the word prepared and that forces the reader to pause and comfort this statement. You pause right there and actually reflect upon actually how well prepared they are. 
You'll also notice at the end of slate, you've got end stoppings, full stop. And that forces the reader to dwell on the feelings of safety and solidity. Now, you'll also notice there's a full stop between Stucks and Nor. So that safe and comfortable tone is disrupted and the poem here becomes more fearful. Again, the caesura used is to break the rhythm throughout the rest of the poem. And then you've got the use of enjambment from which might prove company when it blows full blast. The blast comes at the start of a line, possibly suggesting a sharp, unexpected gust of wind. Now, the word blast here is a plosive sound. So it has a greater impact because it comes at the start of the line. If we then move on to have a look at you know what I mean. You know what I mean is the narrator speaking directly to you, the reader. It's in a quite chatty tone, making you reflect on perhaps your own experiences of the storm. We can also call it a conversational style. If we then have a look at the words tragic chorus. Again, tragic chorus, is, this links to Greek tragedy. A chorus comments on and explains the events. Having no trees to act as a chorus suggests the islanders are left on their own to face and interpret the scene. Perhaps the trees would have been um, the barrier between um, the people on the island and the storm, are like protectors. They would have taken part of the storm before it hit the, the, uh, the people on the island. Now we could talk about here that the conversational style could reflect how the narrator within the poem um, feels quite isolated as the storm approaches. We can also um, look at, can you raise a tragic chorus in Gale again, um, to suggest that the chorus is sustained and incessant. Now you'll notice the next sentence, forgetting that it pummels your whole house too, that there is an end of the line here after two, but it's not end stopped. That fear hasn't quite taken hold yet. Now, pummels, very violent verb to describe the wind is quite painful. It personifies the wind to suggest that it's bullying the house or um, constantly hitting and battering at the house. Focusing on the use of the word no is repeated, no trees, no natural shelter. Um, nature again has spared them that so they don't have to worry about those trees being lost. But no shelter again emphasises how barren that place is in contrast to the poet's earlier positive view. Not very, it's quite a negative view that we get of the island. You might think, line 12, might think, i.e. you don't know, um, that the sea is company. Again, suggesting like the familiarity between the people on the island and with the sea. Remember what I said earlier, familiar like a cat to them that's later in introduced. Exploding comfortably. The oxymoron here justifies the feelings of fear and safety. The poet is used, um, used these sounds because the storms are part of life. It's familiar to them, therefore comfortable. That they're used to it as part of the life they have on the island and perhaps without it they wouldn't be as comfortable living on it. Line 14, but no when it begins the flung spray hits. Now begins, it begins and spray hits. You've got assonant I sounds here. If we then move on to line 15, spits like a tame cat. The simile here shows how familiar things become frightening during a storm. Now, you'll notice there is another sejura here after no, and that pause makes the reader consider the absence of the safety and security upon the island. If we have a look at hits and spits, okay, you've got the use of sibilant sounds, which is on lines 14 and 17, which combine to imitate the hissing and spitting of the sea. If we put this all together as in spits, hits, salvo, savage, strafe, bombarded, you've got violent language there that runs throughout the final six lines, which emphasises the danger and fear. The military language of salvo and strafe and bombardment personifies the weather as if it's attacking the people on the island. 
Now, if we have a look again at spits like the tone cat, like I said, it is a simile, which refers the cat to a pet, a friend, something that the poem is comfortable with. So this again is the reference to the storm. If we look at the fact that the cat turns savage, okay, the cat turns savage is in line 16. Again, it's the idea that this familiarity turns violent. And the enjambment here suggests that there's surprise at the sudden change in the cat slash sea, that the people on the island are surprised that the sea has changed this quickly to them. Line 16, we just sit tight while wind dives. Again, I said sit and wind, they're assonant I sounds, okay? But there is that idea that there's nothing they can do. Nature has all the power over them. Nothing. The use of the word nothing could also suggest a fear of losing everything, having it destroyed by the storm. If we go back to the words invisibly and space, empty air and nothing, um, their fear is not of anything they can see or fight, which again emphasises their powerless, their powerlessness. You know, the storm itself, it's not something that they can prepare for, they can fight against. So if we go, I've already mentioned strafe, salvo and bombarded, that's language we normally use to describe the war. Um, and the wind here is compared to a fighter plane attacking the island. Now we end the sentence with, it is a huge nothing that we fear. The storm is invisible and there's nothing solid there. This contrasts with the solid rock mentioned in the second line of the poem. And it's that idea of fear is a repetition of the end of line nine. Only this time it is end stopped. Fear has taken hold at this point and the reader is left to consider this at the end of the poem. So Storm on the Island is full of images and fear and violence, although the poem begins with images of safety and security. The tone changes around line six and a sense of loneliness and fear takes over. Nature becomes violent as the usual pleasant trees and the sea become frightening and are dangerous forces. To emphasise the violence of the storm, Heaney uses descriptive words and phrases usually associated with war, such as blast, bombarded, salvo. To involve the reader in his fear of the storm, the poet uses direct dress, the second person, you, throughout to bring us closer to the experience of the islanders. So if we're looking at it pummels your, ha your house, the word pummel means to hit somebody or something with repeated blows. And this conveys the, the image of the house being attacked by an aggressive force. Now, if we have a look at a bit of context behind the poem, you'll notice that the first eight letters of the title spell Storm Aunt. <clears throat> Stormont is the name given to the Northern Ireland's Parliament buildings. So this is the executive where the executives of Northern Ireland meet. It's a building which has long been associated with politics. Now the use of the word Stormont in the title could suggest that the storm could be about some of the violent political disturbances that Ireland had experienced, example between the Catholics and Protestants, or the Irish Republicans who wanted independence from Britain. So there were divided loyalties at the time. So during the Troubles, Protestant and Catholics were intolerant of one another. Each gave their allegiance to different countries. Protestants wanted to be part of the United Kingdom, whereas Catholics wanted Northern Ireland reunited with the Republic of Ireland. Protestants feared the idea of union with the Republic of Ireland and believed that Catholics would not be tolerant of Protestant beliefs. Catholics could not forget the persecution they had suffered during England's conquest of Ireland and deeply mistrusted the Protestants. So as I've said, Storm on the Island could refer to the troubles in Northern Ireland that took place in the latter years of the 20th century. There are images of terrorist violence found within the poem. So words such as blast, exploding, fear, bombarded, don't just describe the literal storm, but they could also represent the storm of violence that was happening in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. So as I said, Stormont is the first eight letters and it's, it's the government building of Northern Ireland in Belfast. The word Ireland has an obvious phonetic similarity to the word Ireland. Therefore, the poem works on two levels. 
as a description of a storm and as an external uh, extended metaphor for the political situation that was happening in Northern Ireland. So to just reiterate, Storm on the Island is a poem that can be taken literally as a dramatic monologue on the life and attitude of island people facing a storm. Or it can be understood as an extended metaphor of a political struggle on the island of Ireland. Whether these forces are natural or political, the phrase collective responsibility comes to mind. The people have to get their act together or else they will not survive. So Seamus Heaney knew both worlds intimately, although he chose through his poetry not to become a political voice outright. So he doesn't really go into a lot of detail about politicalness, but he does concentrate his energies on rural scenes. Um, so here you have got a lot of um, links back to what he would have uh, um, seen on his island. From the first line of the poem, it is clear that the speaker represents a people, specific a family and island folk. In this sense, the voice is that of a spokesperson addressing someone who does not quite understand their predicament. We are prepared, we build our houses squat. Again, to remind you that the tone is defiant and yet conversational. It's as if the speaker is having to explain to outsiders just why things are as they are, as they need to be. Heaney uses a basic pantomimeter, pantomimeter template, 10 and 11 syllable lines with varying feet, trochaic and spondaic and so on, to break up ionic rhythm and create tension. A more, the form is solid, um, a single 19 line stanza reflecting the island and the strong architecture. Again, to remind you, the language is sometimes brutal, a military, plast, pommels, exploding, flung, spits, dives and strafes, bombarded. So remember, the poem was published in 1966 in his first book, The Death of a Naturalist. Um, Storm on the Island is a poem that gives voice to people who live in constant fear of power of natural storms. The poem's theme is therefore the ongoing conflict between humans and nature. Life on an island may, from a distance, seem idyllic and peaceful, but this poem views that life from a totally different perspective, one of survival. This is reflected in the empathetic first three words, which formed a slogan, we are prepared. The remainder of the first line is, is iamic reinforcement of domestic certainty. The houses are built squat to withstand any storm. This line sets a firm foundation for the rest of the poem. Here is a determined people who know just what they have to do. The following four lines are all about preparedness and bareness of that island environment. A defiant tone is set right from the off, tempered somewhat by casual asides. As you see, you know what I mean. It's as if the speaker is right next to the reader, explaining away the reasons for preparedness, focusing on the local needs. It's like Heaney is taking the reader by hand and guiding them into the poem's natural heart, which is usually earthy, sometimes dark, but always enlightening. There is repetition of certain key words and phrases, for example, company and fear and never troubled us, tragic chorus, and we just sit tight, spits like a tame cat. And a certain tension is set between an almost relaxed attitude to the natural surroundings and the storm itself. The island don't grow cereal crops, there are no trees. The farmer cannot therefore be lost. The former cannot therefore be lost, which is a bonus when the storm islands are blowing. The latter might be missed because they are, they could conceivably be said to be company, a distraction from having your houses battered. You've got enjambment from lines three to nine, which works especially well because the reader is encouraged to move on and build up the, or build up the sense just as the storm gathers its energy before lashing out and expending. And you've also got assonance with your vowel sounds, um, raise, gale, listen, thing. Because of the na lack of natural shelter, the storm is felt uh, all the more as a threat. The sea, again, is likened to company, like the trees, may appear friendly, but it's not. Like a bomb, it hits the cliffs, then turns inland and becomes savage. In the meantime, the wind takes on the char our character of an invading aeroplane, it dives and strafes. The only difference being that you cannot see the wind as you would see your the plane. Towards the end of the poem, the speaker's tone becomes philosophical, which is a puzzle. Perhaps having spent so long on the island and become so used to storms, the speaker has developed an alternative take on their nature. The wind is presented as invisibly, space as a salvo, a series of aggressive acts. They are bombarded with the empty hair and fear, fear a huge nothing. 
All this leaves the reader with an image of the speaker, or indeed the speaker together with the whole of the island population, inside their squat houses sitting out the storm. There they are surviving the violence of nature, safe between their walls, whilst outside mayhem rules. That last line seems to be the thought of someone who has seen it all and is now puzzling over the substance of the storm. Just what is a storm? Basically, it is very strong and forceful winds which no one can see, only when it comes um, against material objects, things we do not know it is there. There are several literary devices, just to remind you, you've got alliteration, um, such as rock and roof, so as you see, think that the wild wind space is also a salvo. Sejura, so the reader has to stop briefly at Sejuras, it alters the rhythm and breathing. The first line has a colon, for example, and there are other lines. So some lines are in 7, 14, 15, 16, have abrupt stops after one word or a short phrase, which signifies the shock of the blast and the sudden endings. So enjambment is when a line continues into the next without punctuation, creating a flow where the reader has to pause and the meaning is maintained. Healy makes use of this, this device throughout the poem. So lines three to nine, for example, three to 16, they build up momentum just as in a natural storm does, um, blowing full, then it recedes momentarily, momentarily. The personification is used where an object or thing is given human characteristics. So the storm's actions are personified as in, they can raise a tragic chorus. So that's when the break, leaves and branches are hit. It pummels, pummels is to thump rapidly. The sea's company, the sea brings solace and combats loneliness. You've got the use of simile, which is the comparison using the words like or as. So the, the flung spray hits the very window, spits like a tame cat turned savage. When you're doing your analysis for this poem, think about some questions that you, how you would personally respond to it. Um, do you think the speaker likes living on the island? Why? Why not? What's the effect of describing the leaves and the branches of that tragic chorus? Why do you think the poem addresses the reader directly? What effect does it have on you? Um, what is the effect of comparing the sea to a tame cat turned savage? How can you link the poem to the troubles that were happening in Northern Ireland? Now, you'll be expected to take the poem Storm on the Island and summarise what the poem is about in full sentences and take the poem with points you can remember from your initial study. Add any responses or ideas you have from reading it now. Select three or four quotations which you, look, which you like the look of and explode them. Remember to explore multiple connotations of individual words and identify any obvious techniques such as metaphor, simile, powerful verbs and enjambment. Can you say anything about the poem's form? How does it appear on the page? Hint, look at the single stanza and the lack of the rhyme scheme. Do some contextual research. So I've given you some ideas behind the Troubles in Northern Ireland. How does that link to the poem? So explore the political context of Northern Ireland. So we said the first eight letters of the title Stormont. What is that? Um, I've mentioned that. Can you remind yourself? Start with the British Library website and the resources in your home learning folder. Find out contextual information to answer these questions and any other interesting articles about this poem. Making links. How and why can this poem be linked to any of the other power and conflict poems? Remember, they are all linked by the theme of power and conflict. So you need to be a bit more specific now in the links that you're making. For example, this poem clearly shows the power of nature. So what, which other poems also contain this idea? If you explore the idea of Stormont and the idea that the storm is actually a metaphor for the troubles in Northern Ireland, can you link that idea with any other poems? And before I move on to the storm on the island exam questions, um, storm on the island, you could perhaps compare that to exposure, where they both look at nature as being presented as the enemy. So there are two aspects of nature described in the poem, remember, they both have a negative effect on the islanders. The island is inhospitable, um, nothing grows there, the earth is wizened, there are no trees or stacks or stooks. 
it's the extremes of nature that the islanders fear. This war imagery is used to suggest that nature is attacking the island and it's bombarded by the empty air and, and the wind strifes itself. So that connective theme to exposure would be that nature is presented as an enemy. We could also look at the theme of negative emotions, that people fear situations they cannot understand or control. Um, the islanders can't control the weather, they can't control that storm. So there's that progression from security to fear within the poem. And there's a confident opening of we're prepared, but that changes to a confession of fear by the end of the poem. The fear is amplified because nature is invisible, it's that abstract force. The speaker calls the storm a huge nothing. This highlights the fact that the islanders can do nothing to combat it. The image of the tame cat turned savage shows how even familiar things become scary in the storm. And at this point, when we're looking at um, people fear situations they can't understand or control, you can compare that to the prelude, um, the stealing of the boat or bayonet charge. Now, remember, we talked about this earlier, but um, the poem uses lots of sounds, so the use of sound. Um, and those repeated sounds create different effects. For example, spray, heat, spits contain sibilant assonance. You've got I and plosive sounds. These combine to imitate the fitful spitting sound of sea spray, which contributes to the savage description of the sick. The wind is also described using sibilant sounds. It dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. This imitates the wind whistling across the island. And the plosive sounds, example space and bombarded, create a sudden gust of wind which add to the feelings of uncertainty and fear. Well, the use of um, sounds in the storm on the island can also be compared to exposure and the preludes of the sealing the boat. Again, with these links, go back to your revision. Can you see where there are quotations from each poem that you can compare um, to find similarities or differences? We know in Storm on the Island there's a change of the mood from the beginning to the end. So the poem is structured specifically around that switch in mood from safety to security to fear and threat. The confident opening is mirrored by the helplessness. So we are prepared to we are bombarded. We have a confident opening to helplessness. The storm is uncontrollable and all the islanders can do is just sit tight. The poem ends with fear. Um, this is the overriding emotion of the islanders. Now the idea of um, some poems have a change in mood, um, you can also compare that to prelude. Can you see where the mood changes in the prelude? Can you find similarities and differences between the prelude and Storm on the Island? So on the screen, we've got an exam question. So it's compare how the power of nature is presented in Storm on the Island and one of the poem from the cluster. So you would be expected to write your introduction, explaining how the power of nature is presented in the poem and how it is also presented in your choice of the second poem. Write your first PA paragraph, remember your PA checklist, and to develop the depth of your analysis by exploring multiple connotations of multiple words within your quotation. These connotations must be relevant to the focus of the question, in this case, the power of nature. If you continue your response, remember to alternate your PA paragraphs between the two poems. Within your analysis, you must also explore how the poems are similar or different. Remember your comparative connectives. Aim for three PA paragraphs in each poem, so six in total. However, it is quality over quantity, so four really detailed analytical paragraphs, two on each poem, would be fine. As a guide, a really detailed analytical paragraph will be almost one side of A4 paper. Remember to round your response off with a conclusion. Sum up how the power of nature is presented in each poem and which you find the most effective and why. Here's the mark scheme. So to get to level six, convincing critical analysis and exploration, you're looking for 26 to 30 marks. It needs to be critical exploratory comparison, judicious use of precise references to support interpretation, analysis of writer's methods with subject terminology used judiciously, Explor exploration of effects of writer's methods to create meanings, exploration of ideas, perspectives, contextual factors shown by specific details links between context, text and task. If we go down to level five, this is thoughtful and developed consideration, not critical and exploratory. 
Level four is showing a clear understanding. You've got a clear comparison, effective use of references, clear explanation of methods, relevant subject terminology. You understand the effects of writers' methods to create meanings, and you understand ideas, perspective, contextual factors that are shown between the links between context, text, and task. To go down to level four, which is 11 to 15 marks, level three, it's explained, structured comments. There's some explained comparison, references to support a range of relevant comments, explained comments, identify, identification of effects of writers' methods to create meanings, some understanding of implicit ideas, perspectives. So remember, you need to be looking at level three and upwards, guys. Level two, supported relevant comments. Level one, simple, explicit comments. You see how they move up from simple, supported, explained, clear, thoughtful, and then exploratory. So a mind of the set task, you need to go to File Explorer, Pedmore Shared Area, Q Drive, English, Student Write, Year 10 Home Learning. Also think about Year 11 and prepare for future learning. In the autumn term of Year 11, you will study your final set text for GCSE English Literature, which you should have already purchased. This leave will be Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Frankenstein or A Christmas Carol. You should read this text now. Make notes on the main characters, events and themes throughout the novel. Challenge yourself and explore websites such as the British Library to find out more contextual detail. Remember, context refers to the time the novel was set in as well as how characters and events change and develop throughout the text, allowing the reader to make links. Questions and support. Feel free to email me in time and send me any pictures of your revision resources so I can see what you've been getting on with.